Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, thank you very much for coming to this event, Televising in the Future, 1984 and the Imagination of Nigel Neal. Um, I'm Robin Bunce. Um, I teach history and politics at Homerton College here at the University of Cambridge, just down the road. Um, I, I, I'm a specialist in all kinds of things, including utopias and dystopias. Um, in fact, I teach on the undergraduate course, The Politics of the Future, which is all about that. Um, I'm going to be inviting the panel on in a moment, but before I do that, um, we're going to see a couple of clips. So these are clips of, from um, the BBC's 1954 adaptation of 1984. Um, they've been, they have been, some of this has been available as bootlegs in the past, but this material has really been sitting in the BBC's archives um, for years and years and years. It's been remastered recently and it's available on Blu-ray um, from Monday, so we're having something a bit like a sneak peek. Um, the first thing you're going to see is the head of um, BBC um, drama, um, making an announcement about the show, and then we're going to cut um, unceremoniously to the um, beginning of, um, to the beginning of 1984. So if we can have clip one, that would be fantastic, and I'll see you in about two and a half minutes. Last Sunday. The teleplay stars, um, just get the technology working. The teleplay stars um, Yvonne Mitchell as Julia, Peter Cushing as Winston Smith, and Andre Morel as O'Brien. Um, and it's adapted by Nigel Neal, who's probably best known today um, for the Quatermass stories, but had a profound um, influence on television way beyond that. So introduction done, allow me to introduce my panel. First of all, we have, um, Una, we have Dr. Una McCormack, um, New York Times and USA Today best-selling science fiction author. Um, she's also the chair of the editorial board of Gold SF, an imprint of Goldsmiths Press, dedicated to discovering and publishing new intersexual feminist science fiction. Also, secondly, John Deere, Please, would you come and join me? John is a writer and television critic, or writer of, and critic of TV and film. Um, he's written for the BFI. He's written for Horrified magazine. Um, he's also one of the people who provides a commentary to the new um, Blu-ray and the new um, DVD. He's a specialist in weird old telly. And last but by no means least, Andy Murray. Andy is a lecturer and writer. Um, he wor his works include Into the Unknown and the first full biography of Nigel Neal, also um, one of the people providing a commentary to the new DVD, which is available on Monday. So thank you all enormously for joining us. 
Um, Andy, what are the origins of, of the show we're talking about today? What's the origins of um, 1984 at the BBC? Well, so, yeah, so, I mean, the, the novel's published in June 1949. This is December 1954, so it's only five years, which isn't a long time, but even in that five years, there's kind of quite a frenzy of activity. I think the book is recognised pretty much immediately as, as, as being very significant. Um, there are two... Um, radio adaptations in the States, there's a, a, a TV adaptation in the States in 1953. Uh, there's talk of a theatre adaptation, there's talk of a film, and the BBC are kind of onto it almost immediately mm -hmm. as something they want to make a version of. But it's difficult. <laughs> uh, it's a difficult sort of nut to crack. So uh, at one point there's talk of doing it for radio, uh, as a sort of very esteemed radio producer called uh, Douglas Cleaverden, uh, who, who is very keen to do it. That doesn't come off. Um, Kenneth Tynan, writer and critic, he's very keen to direct a TV version, that doesn't come off. And then there's a script written by um, Orwell's widow, uh, mm -hmm. Sonia Brownell, uh, in collaboration with a guy called Hugh Falcus, who was a writer, mm -hmm. a broadcaster. Uh, but again, it's kind of seen that this still hasn't been solved. Uh, at this point, you kind of enter Nigel Neal and Rudolf Cartier into the story. Uh, so Nigel Neal, there we go, Nigel Neal, uh, a scriptwriter working for the BBC, uh, predominantly working in adaptations, mm -hmm. as kind of what the, a lot of TV drama was at the time. Rudolf Cartier, uh, a sort of Austrian-born uh, producer, what we'd call mm -hmm. a producer-director in modern terms. They'd established themselves as a really sort of good and capable team, been working together a few times by this point. Uh, they made the Quatermass Experiment in 1953, which is this six-part TV drama, science fiction thriller, which goes down very well, an original piece, that's not an adaptation. Uh, at the end of 1953, uh, an actor called Richard Todd, a very sort of a respected actor in his day, film actor, comes to the BBC and says, I want to do a, a, an adaptation of um, Wuthering Heights, I want to star in it. So the BBC say, OK, turn to Cartier and Neil and say, you, you two know what you're doing, you go off and do it. And they do it, and it's fine. At which point the BBC turn around to Neil, uh, Cartier and Neil again and said, right, OK, 1984, you're the guys to do it. Mm. Um, there are kind of different stories of how this happened. Uh, Neil tells it as a story that the BBC thought that because they'd done the Quatermass experiment, they were what he called future creatures. Mm -hmm. That's to say, not people from the future, but people <laughs> who could write about the future. It's not actually even mentioned on screen, but supposedly in the, in, in sort of, uh, in the documentation, the Quatermass experiment happens in 1965. Mm -hmm. So there's this thought of, OK, you know how to write about the future, so you're, you can do 1984. Mm -hmm. uh, the other version of that story, which is probably more reliable, uh, <laughs> is that Cartier is brought in board. He's shown the existing script, this Hugh Falcus script, knows it won't work, but says, mm -hmm. OK, we'll get Nigel Neal in. He knows what he's doing. Scrap that script. Give us a bit more time, and, um, and we can do it. Fantastic, fantastic. So, John, what had Neil and Cartier done before 1984? Well, Neil had come to the BBC in, I think, uh, 51. Um, he'd written um, uh, a series of short stories and published in, uh, in 49, uh, same year as, a, as 84, uh, Tomato Cane and, and other stories. That he'd, he'd written over, over the previous few years, had enough to publish. That won the Somerset Maugham Award. Um, his publishers wanted him to write a novel. He doesn't really think he has, has a novel in him. He wants to get involved. He's been, yeah, he's been, to, been to Rada. He's decided he probably wasn't going to be an actor. And bear in mind, TV is, 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 is still very primitive in those days, but it's an interesting industry mm -hmm. to get into. There's limited stuff beyond the RSC and rep. He's, he's at the RSC um, for a bit. But he has uh, success with um, a, uh, a radio play. He, he, he writes about a mind disaster. Uh, in, on, 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 the, on the Isle of Man. He then goes to the BBC basically and says, what can I do? Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's, a, it's still a fairly short, slightly nebulous industry at this stage. And he becomes a bit of a writing factotum. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he helps, as, as Andy said, the vast majority of TV output in the early 50s is adaptations mm -hmm. um, because they're relatively easy, seen as easy, easy to film. You're watching something not too far from filmed plays. Mm -hmm. um, and he works on those as well. He works on um, some children's TV. He does Vegetable Village. Uh, if anything ever survives a Vegetable Village, <laughs> we may be able to see where the origins of the Quatermass experiment come from. I doubt <laughs> possibly, but um, anyway, um, he works. He eventually um, work, crosses crosses paths with Cartier 
uh, on providing additional dialogue for a drama called Ar- Arrow to the Heart. Now, Cartier had uh, has come from Austria. He'd worked in the German film industry. He'd made uh, some films in he'd made some films in Germany, and up to the mid thirties, uh, Rudolf Cartier was Jewish, so um, he had to leave mm. Germany. He spends a little bit of time uh, in America before working for the BBC. He worked for the BBC uh, before the war, uh, briefly. Um, and when the war finishes, he works a, a little bit um, in, in the fledgling um, British film industry, but comes back to the BBC to work mm-hmm. in, in 50, I think it's 50, 52. Um, Cartier is dynamic. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's one of those occasions you see occasionally in the BBC, it would happen when, I think, when Sidney Newman joined later on, that someone would come from the outside mm-hmm. to bring... Uh, mm. a new lease of life to, to, to mm. so the possibilities of television. Mm. And it was Cartier that uh, was most uh, responsible for taking TV in new and exi- mm. in exciting di- directions. So they first crossed, they first crossed paths briefly on um, Arrow to the Heart. They then do an adaptation, as Andy said, of, 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 of Wuthering Heights. Um, and when it comes to uh, there being a gap in the schedules... Uh, in, in the summer of 19, 1953, uh, Nigel Neal uh, has the opportunity to write a six-part serial, um, which is the Quatermass Experiment, which mm-hmm. pretty much invents popular mm-hmm. telly as we know it. <laughs> You'd see it now as what would be seen as cult or sci-fi. Then it was just event mm-hmm. television. There wasn't mm-hmm. really the sort of trying to think more line of duty than, yeah. than Blake Seven. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered I how long it would be until we got a reference to Blake Seven. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, it, and it wasn't anywhere. And it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, that's that's phenomenally successful, uh, both in terms of uh, an extremely interesting story, but it's shot in a generally mm. dynamic way. And it's live. Mm. And all this is mm. li- going out live. There's pre-filmed inserts, mm. but not all that much uh, in the way of pre- in the pre-filmed inserts. And yet we have. You know, we have things like found footage happening. Mm. We have a bit where, um, and only the first two episodes survive because they were tele-recorded. Um, mm. The other two episodes going out live, we, we, we don't have the other, the other four episodes. Um, but there were bits where there's like, you know, there's within the fiction of the, of the episode, there's a BBC crew, and then we mm. see through the BBC crew. So um, mm. both Neil and Cartier are pushing suddenly mm. with something rather beyond a classical adaptation of Pride and Prejudice, as good as, mm. as, 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 good as that might be. So when it comes to, 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 to 1984... Cartier is brought on because it's technically going to be very demanding, and Cartier wants Neil to be. Mm. So that's, mm. So, mm. But that's what that's, that's what they did before. Neil has come. Neil has grown up on grown up on the Isle of Man, um, and sees himself possibly as a bit of an outsider um, mm. to the industry. Although you know he's gone to Rada, he's not completely yeah. of the outside of the establishment. But Cartier has come over as a as a essentially a, a, yeah, a World mm. War II refugee. Mm. Um, and both outside people bring something new mm. and different to, to, to the BBC. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I, I totally take your point about them kind of inventing popular television, as we'll see in a moment. Mm. And when we move to the next clip, this, this is incredible television. It's really beautifully shot. Una, um, this is a bit more speculative, this question, but um, what do you think, Nigel Neal, um, what piqued his interest? What inspired his imagination? What did he find in 1984? Okay, well, I think that we, um, I, I think as Andy has said, this is, this is a book that's only just been published, mm-hmm. that's extremely contemporary, that uh, uh, people, obviously people are talking about it, people are reading about it, so there must be an appeal to work on something that is, that mm. is, that is fresh and, and current. Um, I think also, uh, aren't they sort of hurrying it to get it out ahead of the Columbia yeah, picture? Yeah. yeah, so there's an American movie uh, <laughs> that's being made, which is terrible, really, <laughs> really awful. Um, so that the hurrying kind of to get a steal on that, there's already been a, a, a TV version in the States, which is mm. it's not bad. I think you find it on YouTube. Mm-hmm. It's pretty brisk, um, but, uh, you know, it hits everything. Um, so there's a, there's a hurry to get this out, to be working on something contemporary. I th- we know sort of a little mm-hmm. bit, there's a, a, I think you got it on a slide, actually. We have a, an article that Neil writes for the Radio Times at the mm. time. And what he foregrounds in that is his interest in you speak, this idea mm. of the, the abolition of thought mm. through the erosion of language. Um, so that's what he chooses to foreground when he writes about it. And Neil comes back to this in a, in a later play, a 60s play, um, called Year of the Sex Olympics, which is a great title. <laughs> uh, you're you're going to turn on to that, aren't you? You're going to switch that one on. Uh, which, which basically, mm. uh, you know... Um, uh, uh, predicts reality television very, very plausibly, mm-hmm. I think. Um, but the, the, much of the sort of script is written in a kind of eroded mm. um, 
uh, shortened uh, vernacular, mm. and you can see that this has stuck in his mind, and he's uh, he's coming back from the uh, he's comes back to that later. This uh, idea of um, thought controlled mm -hmm. by the limits of language. Um, but I think, like these guys have said, uh, uh, what's absolutely critical with Neil is um, we might look back at this now, and you know, it looks it looks slow, it looks constrained with a, with a sort of modern eye. Um, but they are really breaking new ground mm. in television. Um, I did I did something about um, Neil a, a couple of years ago before lockdown. I was watching Quite a Mass uh, on my laptop on a train, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I was sitting there. I was watching an episode of maybe Quite a Mass, it's a black and white one. And uh, a, a woman came up to me, she tapped me on the shoulder and she said, I still remember uh, watching that mm. in 1950. Well, it absolutely mm. scared the bejesus <laughs> out of me. So mm. people remembered watching these. She's what, you know, mm. she's just seen it on my laptop over the shoulder, but it was memorable enough to come and speak. And what they're doing, I think, Cartier and Neil, and Neil in particular, I think he's, he is thinking about the medium in mm. which he has chosen to work. He's not a theatre dramatist. He's mm. not a film dramatist. He's a screenwriter for television. Mm. And I think right back there in the early 50s, we see the telescreens foregrounded. Mm. He is interested in his medium. Mm. He's interested in writing for it. He's interested in theorising about it. Mm. And he's really, really interested in scaring the bejesus <laughs> out of you in your in your living room mm. at uh, you know whatever time, and that I think is is the appeal of this to Neil. Excellent, excellent. Well, that leads us on very nicely to our next clip. Um, for those people who are joining us um, on the internet. What I, I don't understand the technology, but you know, thank you for joining us. You're not going to see this bit. You had to actually turn up and be here to get to see this bit for copyright reasons. Um, so, but I would like to thank the BFI and the BBC for allowing us to have these clips, the clips that you on the internet can't see. Sorry about that. Anyway, if we could have the second clip, that would be great. There we go. Um, that was the two minute hate, of course. Um, what I want to do now is I want to talk about the, the production design. And I'm going to go back to the book for a moment. So this is how Orwell describes the Ministry of Truth um, in the book. Um, and the, the scene we've just seen is shot inside the uh, Ministry of Truth. So the Ministry of Truth, Orwell says, is an enormous um, 
pyramid, the pyramidal structure of glittering white concrete soaring up terrace after terrace 300 meters into the air. From where Winston stood, it, um, it was just possible to um, read, picked out on the white face and elegant lettering, the three slogans of the party, and there they are, war is peace, freedom of is slavery, and ignorance is strength. Neil's script um, follows this pretty exactly. So this is from the BBC Written Archive. No, forgive me, this is, no it is, yes, it is from the BBC Written Archive. Um, and Neil's script describes it as a shining um, pyramidal building over a thousand feet high, the party slogans, black and white banners. Um, so yes, so the party slogans on this um, in Neil's script are, are picked out in black and white banners. Um, what strikes me about this is that on the one hand, this is very faithful to um, Orwell's book. I mean, incredibly faithful to Orwell's book. Um, and this is um, a production sketch from the BBC Written Archives. Um, they were um, obviously we saw this realised earlier on today, um, and you can see again very very faithful reproduction of, of what Orwell's talking about. But at the same time, he's bringing in some. Um, ideas from the contemporary world. So the idea of having black and white banners with slogans strung across masonry, and that's different to Orwell's book, um, is, is something which would, would have been very recognisable from wartime London. Um, so, I mean, that, those are kind of my thoughts on the production, or my initial thoughts on the production. I mean, what did you lot make, to make about the production design and how Neil and Carte went about designing the future? Um, I haven't seen it so crisply before mm. yet, actually. Have it? It, does, it looks absolutely fantastic, doesn't it? Mm. <laughs> it looks absolutely great. I, I think that Christmas, uh, it's lovely to see it like that. Um, whenever I hear War is Peace I'm, 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 and, and watch that scene, I'm, I'm hashtagging it. Yeah? yeah. OK, we've got a little, a little, a little Twitter <laughs> event going on there, I think. Um, <laughs> I'm watching it there and thinking, uh, I, 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 all of it seems to me um, to be going through the grammar of that lens. It's the lens that we're tracking. Mm. It's, the, it's the work that the camera or the, the eye is doing on these people. It's the observation, I think. And it, it, it's obviously an extremely claustrophobic set as well. I mean, that's uh, what's lovely about television is, that, is when people make the kind of constraints, the, uh, they make them features and not bugs, yeah? Mm. <laughs> there's scene, uh, well, there's a sequence where um, Smith goes from his home in Victory Mansions, mm. which is you know, run mm. down, and... Mm. Uh, there's a film sequence. He then travels to uh, the parole sector to go to mm. a bar because he wants to talk to an older mm. parole member who can try and remember what it was like before mm. before the revolution. Now he goes across a wasteland. Mm. That wasteland would later on become BBC Television Centre. Yeah. Uh, as well. <laughs> but the language of the of the of the landscape is clearly a desolate L London as was. Mm. And if you were watching this in 1954, you would be very familiar mm. with what a desolate London looked mm. like. And I think there's a theme there of, you've been through hell, mm. we've come out the other side, mm. and you know, we won, um, just, mm. but, what, but there was an alternative that was far, far worse. Mm. The fascist element that's brought up, and you know, when this, when this went out, the, the, the most, um, vociferous uh, level of, of criticism from the journalists came from the Daily Worker and mm -hmm. said how, yeah, yeah, how basically you're, you're, you're demonising communism. It's not. Mm. You're yourself. The idea of you've got there, um, you know, you're not least of you, you're being told to hate someone called Goldstein. Uh, mm. that's, that's not a particularly subtle reference mm. to who the enemy, who the enemy is. Mm. And as you see, and as through this beautiful film sequence, which has been cleaned up gorgeously by, by, by the BFI, um, you see a London that is even worse than mm. the one that you're mm. experiencing, and that everyone, pretty much everyone watching this programme will have experienced mm. the, the, second world, the Second World War, pretty much everyone will have lost, lo mm. lost loved ones uh, mm. in the World War, and you're being told, here's, an, here's, a, here's a future where it's worse. Mm. That's, that's the, uh, mm. Did you have anything to add to that, Andy? Yeah, well, I, was going to, I mean, so in terms of the, the production generally, mm. we've sort of alluded to the fact that Neil and Cartier were, were sort of very bold. And a lot of the technology that we used in the studio was technology that was used before the war, mothballed. Mm. And they, they haven't sort of quite... If you, were, if you were working in live television drama and you wanted an easy life, mm. you would not try and adapt 1984. Mm. Uh, and I think Neil himself said that... The, I don't think he'd read the book before he came to adapt it, and he reads it, and he just... The, the sheer complication of it really hits him. Uh, and there's a quote, and I think it's included in one of the extras on, on, on the release, actually, the BFI release, where Neil says, it wasn't just a challenge, it was a dare. Mm. And it's just, I think, how do you do that? And, and mm. they, yeah. they did it with, with sort of mm. great, 
Of the word that comes to mind, I do, I, this would be no good in colour, would it? Then the words <laughs> that comes to mind actually is austerity. Yes. Yeah. It's yes. austerity Britain. It's, mm. it's purred back. It's monochrome. I watched, I, I watched all the adaptations uh, uh, preparing for this last week, and I watched um, the 80s one as well, which they've mm. come to. But then, in one of those weird things that you do where you, maybe you're in the same mind space, I watched um, Theodore Dreyer's Passion of Joan of Arc for the first time. Okay. And I felt like I was in the same space. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. There was a sort of austerity to the set, mm. a claustrophobia, a slight tilting. And then obviously you've got this mm. story of a sort of, um, you know, a forced confession, interrogation, mm. and a camera which holds mm. on a sort of mm. physical degradation of, mm. of someone, uh, 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 particularly at the end. But uh, yeah, austerity, a kind of purring back. Uh, I would love to, I think we talk a lot about the impact of this. I would love to know some kind of influences on the shot choices and that kind mm. of thing. I don't know how well documented that is. What, what um, media they had consumed mm. during the 30s and 40s yeah. and, uh, and, and how close it is to silent movie making. Mm. Mm. No, it's interesting you should talk about the austerity and the kind of rundown nature of London because in the script it's very, very clear that, that Neil is briefing, we want really shabby streets, we want really broken down streets. Um, and I was amazed at the level of detail that Neil went into specifying the look of everything from the costumes to the haircuts to the street scenes. And lots of it, of course, is references to the world that they knew. So I was really interested that the members of the inner party and Big Brother wear Eisenhower jackets. Mm -hmm. So a reference to a kind of American domination, which is obviously there in the novel. Um, the, the, the uniforms of the, um, of, the, of the Ministry of Love Guards are briefed as um, um, SS uniforms as worn by, uh, you know, as worn by Nazis. And um, the stew's referred to as being a bit like the stew in the BBC canteen. So, yeah, so all kinds of things being kind of merged together. And th I th the thing that strikes me is that, you know, the Daily Worker, there's so little about communism in this. In the, I, I think the word socialism is only used once to explain what Ingsoc means. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, like Orwell's novel, he's attacking all kinds of things. And I think Neil really gets that and really picks up on that. You have to watch mm. this with the eye of a contemporary that mm. will be watching it. I think it's not like the 1980s film where mm. it, it's become retro almost yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you have to to put yourself back in the 50s mm, mm. so how faithful do you think this is to the novel I mean I've just made a case that I think it's I think there's a lot here which reflects all Wales original um, or original ideas um, I, Neil said that he felt of the of the um, versions that he'd seen it was the most faithful but I think he says that before the the, the, um, the version broadcast in 1984 I mean what do you reckon do you think this is a, a more or less faithful adaptation it's faithful to the spirit of the book, isn't it? It's yeah. that thing, of yeah. how, how, and I think in terms of comparing it to those other versions, maybe it strays away. Certainly Neil hated, I'm sort of very down on this, aren't he? But the 1956 version, uh, and mm. you know, he, he was actually outspoken about... It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, you know, it, and he said, in fact, you know, you've made something that Big Brother would have been proud of. Right. Pretty mm. blunt, really, isn't it? But uh, again, it's like if you read the novel, so much of it, certainly the, the, the first part of it, is in, is in Winston's mind and through Winston's eyes. Mm. He doesn't interact with people that much. He sort of wanders around. He interacts with people a bit, but then he'll go off and interact with somebody else. There isn't sort of that narrative thread. Mm. So how do you tell that? Um, and that, that part, which, you know, sort of famously where he gets hold of Goldstein's book and reads it, and he just the book stops and becomes a book within a book. Mm. How do you turn that into television? Mm. So he's, he's solved those problems, and I think that was the thing of, of sort of trying to do this BBC version. That was how do you turn this into television, and mm. he solves it. He, he sort of finds a way of doing it, which is nevertheless faithful to what the book's trying to do. Yeah, mm. his challenge is how do you, how do you visually dramatise a book which is about thought crime, mm. so is about your internal narrative and the corrosion of that, mm. and how do you dramatise something which is which is um, about the corrosion of text? Mm. So a lot of this book is uh, mm. certainly the first part. I hadn't read it for about twenty five years actually. Uh, a lot of the first part is about Winston's job. It's about altering mm. text and that process. Mm. Uh, and 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 yes, he he. It, you can't put those on screen. You, you, how do you do internal narration? The eighties film has a monologue, doesn't it, mm. which I think sort of covers mm. that. Mm. And yet, yes, you would call it a faithful mm. adaptation. I think. Mm. I mean, there is monologue in. Um, yeah. But it, very, it has to be played in live, so yeah. you have to be very. <laughs> you have to be feel very limited. You don't do that freely. No, do no, you? it has yeah. to be. It, it, it has to be chosen. I think Neil, as more of potentially uh, an outsider. To, uh, to the British establishment than Orwell was, gives it a different slant. Mm. And I think um, Neil's 
uh, treatment of... Um, Neil's positive about humanity. Yep. He's, he's generally, um, mm. when you, throughout, throughout Neil, Neil's works, um, whatever he felt about an individual, as a group, he's positive about the future of humanity. Mm. Not many people mm. can end a, a drama series with a, with a nuclear bomb being yeah. detonated in the UK and for that to be a positive thing. Yes. <laughs> it, it works. <laughs> uh, but with, 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 with Neil, he does it and, it, and it, and it makes sense. But he hates institutions. He hates the, yep. pro and he hates the bureaucracy mm. and the processes that humanity creates. Mm. Uh, and as part of an outsider coming from... Uh, coming from growing up, growing up on the on, on the Isle of Man, taking a new taking the BBC in a new stance, I get more of the sense of how institutions mm. are created to the detriment of those mm. that they that, that they purport to serve, mm. possibly more than I do from than, than, than I do from Orwell, because uh, I think Orwell's working through a lot of his own stuff when, right. he, when, he, when, he, when he writes uh -huh. as, uh, right at the end of uh, right at the end of his life, and despite. Uh, what Michael Barry says at the yes. beginning. At the beginning, I find more hope mm. in in this adaptation than I do in the book. Oh, that's interesting. I found more hope in the book than I do in this adaptation. Okay, right, yeah. but that, but we should talk about that in a minute. I think. I that's think a... that's probably difficult because it's, yeah. it's diff mm. as Una says, it's it's harder to internalise mm. uh, in on the on on, mm. on for the TV adaptations. Mm. So there's a more definitive. This is mm. what Smith thinks in the mm. book than possibly you get in. Yeah. And just yeah. and I've you know. It's hard, as we've talked about seeing it in, 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 in context, I saw this relatively late. I'd seen a lot yeah. of Neil before mm. I'd seen mm. this, and perhaps I'm informed by Neil, yeah. Neil's general yeah. positivity. Yeah. But no, I mean, it's like uh, there's a huge amount of con um, controversy about the extent to which there is any hope at all in the book. Yeah. So I'm, I'm pleased. I think it's a, you know, it shows how good Neil is that he can, he can also generate the controversy about the extent to which there's hope in the TV show. While I, uh, while I would completely agree with you that, and, and you know, I, I, I think this is by far the most faithful adaptation of 1984 made in the 1950s. And I completely concur that the 1956 Columbia version, which I think was funded by the CIA, is dreadful. <laughs> it really is it really is awful I, I remember saying to my dad should I watch it and he said oh no don't watch it it was awful obviously I ignored him and I watched it and you I can see the I angle they're going for it. here which I'm not entirely sure is what, what Orwell was no. going for <laughs> the sex element is probably yes. rather played up a bit absolutely a bit right. So, yeah, so no, dreadful adaptation. But, yeah, yeah. All, um, Nigel Neal's version, I think, is, is by far the most faithful. But at the same time, it seems to me that he is bringing in other influences. Um, and um, you mentioned this earlier, Una. This is The Last Re uh, Rebel of Airstrip One. So this is very rare in the sense that, um, from what I've seen, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, Neal doesn't write a huge amount about politics. But this is him talking about the politics of the book and the politics of his adaptation. As you say, you know, he, he ends with this, this coda about new speech, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, it seems to me that he's also borrowing a little bit from H.G. Wells um, in this adaptation and perhaps also um, Brave New World. That, that seems to be in there a little bit as well. I mean, the, the bits I'm interested in as far as H.G. Wells goes, um, there's this reference early on to a weed-choked Thames as a result of an apocalyptic war. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that seems... Oh, the weed joke, we, we encounter that in War of the Worlds. There's also some of the things he says about language which seem to me to be truer of um, truer of H.G. Wells' concerns about the future of language than all Wells. And the, there's the emphasis on artificial insemination or art sem, which yeah. is... It's, I think it's one sentence in the book but there are two whole scenes about it in Neil's teleplay. And that seems to be perhaps more, to owe something more to, um, to, um, to Huxley and, and Brave New World. The other thing that strikes me is that Orwell is very clear that there was a war before the establishment of the, um, of the Oceanian regime, but that that war did not end in apocalypse, that they draw back. Whereas this, as we saw earlier, it yeah. begins with an apocalyptic war. Mm. And in that sense, it seems to me that Neil is kind of drawing on other aspects of the dystopian tradition. Um, Brave New World has a dystopian war in it. Things to Come has a dystopian war in it. And there is the, oh, sorry, it has an apocalyptic war in it. And there is the kind of broader Judeo-Christian idea of, of Armageddon, which is, that we which is kind of there in the back of a lot of dystopian writing, the idea that in order to get to a new world, good or bad, you have to go through an yeah. apocalyptic war first. I mean, what do you reckon? Do you think there are other influences going on in this script? Oh, he surely must. I mean, mm. of course he's read Brave New World because that's, mm. that's behind Year of the Sex Olympics. I mean, mm. you know, that, that, that gets uh, uh, fuller treatment there, I think. Um, in terms of 
I, I mean, it's tricky to know, Andy. I mean, uh, do you know his reading? Or, uh, do you he was very well read, but, but yeah. strangely, he seems not to have read 1984 before he came to he, he was certainly a fan of, of, of H.G. Wells. He mm. later adapted uh, mm. First, First Men in the Moon. Mm. Of course. And two things you can take from First Men in the Moon that look really Neelian until you realise they're, mm. the, they're, in, they're in Wells' book uh, is, first of all, the setup where um, someone has invented something fantastic and the romantic lead, all they can think to do is, well, I've got all these old boots I bought during... I, I bought from the army, so I can I, 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 I can use these to make money from this. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's the, it's so it's so small. Mm. It's, I've created something of scientific wonder, but I can think of a use for it. Yeah. Yeah. It'll make me money. That's so that's so that's so minutiae. And the other is there's a there's a scene which um, people would roll their eyes and comes back to how it, it, m m class politics in Britain is is, no is nothing new in that an accident happens in the home of the inventor because three workers all argue it isn't their job to do the, to do the thing, stoking the thing, keeping the pressure, and involve, all, and involve them all clocking off and going to the pub. Mm. Um, and the, the, uh, uh, that's the sort of thing that Neil would take very much into, into his work. Mm. And if you see... Um, First Man in the Moon. Before reading it, you go, "Oh yeah, I can see what Neil's done there." But no, it's a, it's a, it's, it's 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 in the book as well. So it's no surprise mm. to me that he yeah. would that he would be influenced that he's, he would be influenced by Wells, and mm. he, he, he is. Mm. He seemed not to have been particularly well. He was quite disparaging about politics, and basically mm. said he wasn't a joiner in. And again, mm. that's that sort of slightly outsider thing. And lots of people have read his work and said, oh, he's, he's definitely on the left, and lots yeah. of other people say he's definitely right. And obviously, Orwell, we can fairly safely say, was on the left, but it's, mm. it is complicated. Mm. Uh, and so I think there's kind of that thing there of they, they sort of meet in the middle. And it's interesting that Neil never wrote anything like this mm. before, mm. and then afterwards, I don't know whether it sort of just got under his skin or whatever, but mm. sub subsequently he, he did kind of... He worked on an unmade film version of, of Brave New World, mm. Mm. wrote a script for it, and, and as we mentioned before, Year of the Sex Olympics, there were other things that seemed to take him in this direction, mm. and whether this was just a sort of random gig that happened to, to sort of mm. strike him, and, and off he went in that direction generally. And plus we're now into the mid-50s, mm. and um, atomic experimentation... Yes, is is taking place. Yeah. This is the world Neil Neil is Neil, Neil is mm. writing in. He'd touched a bit uh, on adaptations before. I think it's number three mm. as a as a BBC adaptation looking at looking at the the, the, the uses and misuses of nuclear of nuclear energy. Mm. Um, and it would be an area he would mm. continue he would he, he he would continue to explore. So I think that's as much about the world he now lives mm. in. You know, now now thermonuclear tests are being mm. done yeah. um, throughout the world. This will be an easier touchstone as understanding yes. um, you know, yeah. what, what a nuclear explosion means. Mm. Um, yeah, no, in fact, I think, um, I think the Soviet Union detonates its first um, thermonuclear bomb yeah. um, in, uh, just as the BBC is, is, just as he's getting on board with, um, with 1984. And I think, yeah, the mic tests are also happening while he's writing the, the, the screenplay. And as you say, these are bombs of much, a much uh, a huger um, magnitude than the ones yeah. that Orwell um, was, was thinking about when he was writing in 49, I guess. The Korean War is happening. If you look at the, mm. if you look at the, the soldier being used. Yes, you yes. You see a touch to the, potentially yeah. to, to, to the Korean War. Mm. Yeah, He's always quite reactive in that way, and even the mm. three Quatermass serials in the 50s, mm. although they're made sort of five years apart in total, they're each kind of very specifically about that bit of the 50s. So mm. he's always very much kind of looking at what's going on right then, mm. and even on something like this that is set in 1984, he's kind of drawing in what's happening around him. Mm. Mm. No, absolutely. Um, we're going to cut to another clip now. Once again, apologies if you're um, joining us online or you're watching this after the event. Um, you won't be able to see this. Um, <laughs> what I've done now is I've, I've squeezed together two bits of, of the TV show which do not belong together, just for the sake of, um, you know, sake of ease. So we're going to see... I'm sorry about that. I know purists are... I can hear anoraks rustling. Um, but, yeah, um, we're um, going to see Winston walking across um, bombed-out London. Um, we'll be able to see the truth of what John was saying about that. And I, I, I'm always amazed when I'm looking at the script um, how, how often Neil is talking about ruination and leaking buildings and grime. And there's in the script, there's about foul smells. You don't get any of that in the Columbia Pictures version, from what I can remember. And then we're going to see a scene in the Ministry of Truth. So can we have the third clip, please?
Thank you very much. Um, I, yeah, all kinds of things to talk about there. I mean, one thing that struck me, I was at the Barbican recently seeing the um, exhibition about post-war um, post art and post, yeah, post-war modernist art. Um, there's a, a lot of photography of kind of bombed out London, 1951, 1952, 1953. And it's, these sequences would, are of a piece with those. I'm thinking particularly about Bert Hardy. Um, Shirley Baker is doing something similar um, a little bit later in the decade and into the 60s. So yeah, so that, that did strike me very much of, of of its time. Um, what did you make of um, the scene around, um, around the, the novel writing machine? I mean, I, it seems to me that Neil is really interested in this, and I think he's, he, he kind of, he does more with it than Orwell does in the book, although obviously the roots of it in the book. Um, yeah, any thoughts, the novel writing machine? Uh, well, I think it's, a, a, it's congruent with his interest as, you know, being a producer of popular culture. Uh, you know, am I part of this? You know, I am found in the fiction department, aren't I? So, uh, you know, sci-fi sec. Uh, the sci-fi sec, indeed. Yeah. Um, what? What? I, th I think it's worth mentioning Julia at this point. I think. I think Andy, I read this in your book. He says that he makes Julia mm. more of an intellectual. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's uh, that's one of those little moments in the Neil adaptation where I, I think you see the mm. the cracks where the light comes in. Mm. That uh, uh, Julia is. Uh, the, the portrayal of Julia is less misogynist. Yeah. It's, mm. it, it, Julia has an interior life, I think. Mm. Um, so that's, that's why I'm interested. It's beautifully played as well. You kind of see that there's, a, there's an internal reality there as well. Whereas in the novel, um, uh, while uh, um, Winston is reading out chunks of Goldstein's book, Julia just falls asleep, <laughs> doesn't she? <laughs> that's, that's what women do. Um, <laughs> But, yeah, this idea of a novel writing machine, which I, I'm definitely going to adapt and put on my CV, I think. I really <laughs> like the, uh, the idea of being a novel writing machine. It's, as I say, it's to do with possibly his own sense as, as somebody involved in a kind of industrialised process mm. of story making. Mm. So, again, he's coming back to interrogate his own role. Mm. as a maker of television, a maker mm. of popular yeah. fiction, I think. Mm. It's another example of how prescient and how relevant mm. still um, both the novel and this, mm. this, this adaptation mm. are now. Um, O'Brien talks about the different types mm. of, the, you know, basically algorithms that, you know, create mm. porn. Um, yep. mm. um, the Julia wears the sash of, 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 of the, of the anti-sex league mm. um, and as a promotion of that as a, as, as a positive thing echoes, mm. I think, incels mm -hmm. and incel culture mm -hmm. yeah. um, that the, 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 the we now see. And this is, you know, no one will know exactly how um, mass uh, entertainment will be produced in the future, but you can see they're mm. on the right lines mm. For, mm. You know, for both that and for the slightly degrading nature of potentially of, of, so of society as a, as a, as a, as a mm. consequence. That's, you know, mm. in, a, in, a, in a, um, a, a story where it's full of things where you think, oh, that's still depressingly relevant. That's, mm. that's really obvious. Mm. Sorry. I was going to say, it's interesting in terms of sort of where Neil's career is at, at this particular time, because the Quater Mass experiment was a year before, and at this point there's rumblings towards what will be the film version of it, and he kind of runs up against BBC bureaucracy. <laughs> mm. and, he, and he talks about, you know, how frustrating it was to deal with people. Uh, he talks about signing the official secrets act. So I think he is mm. very, sort of very aware of working in an institution that's mm. got all this stuff on that has uh, all these... These relevant and, so yeah, yeah, yeah. and also, I think there's probably this is one of the scenes that he adds, or, or sort of mm. pretty much. I think there's a practical reason as well that you've got a scene that's got O'Brien and Julia literally mm, on yeah. the screen together, mm. and given that they're two of the main characters, it's kind mm. of you know making the viewer aware of how significant they are. Mm. Yeah, don't underestimate the. Um, the technical requirements for rewrites, just to, right. yeah, yeah the, 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 for logistical considerations of mm. doing live live television. Yeah, mm. putting two of your actors there together and. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and there's and there's a scene that goes from Smith in one location to Smith in the other. Yeah. And for the for the second for the second scene, it's just close up on on Yvonne Mitchell mm -hmm. because even though she's talking to Winston, but there's no long shot, there's no establishing a shot, and you wouldn't do that now. Mm -hmm. But the practical reason is. Peter Cushing is running from one bit of the studio <laughs> to another and has to get in before his line. He's got about eight seconds right. to make it. So he comes in and he's moving because he's just run onto the, on, onto the set. So all those things have to be considered when you're mm. still trying to get your message across. Yeah. And the scene yeah. after he goes into the... Uh, that Smith goes into, into the bar mm. where you have about four different mm. scenes of the novel that Neil, Neil brings together mm. and the camera... And this is giant night. Mm. The camera was old-fashioned then. Mm. It's being used. Mm. And the cameras. And um, you've got 
you know, three or four scenes um, that the camera weaves in and out of the actors. And that's, you know, mm. the technical lim limitations that, that, are, that, that, that are apparent that, you know, Cartier has to overcome by getting those mm. there is, you know, that's part of much of the consideration is, is, is when you're adapting mm. the script as, as the bits you want to bring out. It's also, you know, mm. um, the practical considerations of, of physically making it. Mm. Mm. And that can't be underestimated. Yeah. That's what's brilliant about it, though, isn't it? That, you know, you've got those those problems that you're facing yep. up against it. Yep. You've got the choice of either saying, let's not bother, yeah. Yeah. or mm. let's do this incredibly mm. kind of elegant work around, and they go for it, they, they mm. sort of yep. pull it off. Now, Peter, I need you to run yeah. from here <laughs> to here. Mm. Eight seconds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were, and they would have rehearsed for, yeah. for, for mm. weeks, yeah. to, get, to get that right, and he has to be you know, on, his, mm. on his mark. One I notice there's an eyepiece in the description of that machine again. So, uh, oh yeah, any any chance to sort of get a get a camera or um, mm. get this sense of gaze and being watched on yeah. the screen mm. is there. Mm. Yeah. It's worth saying that when you see the when you see the, the telly screens, the vo hear the voice. Mm. That's Nigel Neal. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, that is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, right. And we yeah. should sort of connect this up to Year of the Sex Olympics as well, I yeah. think, which is all about the production of yeah. um, mm. pornography as reality television. Absolutely. And creating reality television. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. It is, yeah. That's his most obvious I think, legacy. One of the things I like about the, um, the scene with the porno right is, that, um, is, is the line that, of course, this is much more sophisticated than the other machines we've got. <laughs> it seems to be that Neil is saying, well, if you want to replicate writers mechanically, you're going to have to do an awful lot of hard work. Yeah. It seems like he's kind of, well, I don't know, my, my feeling is he's kind of emphasising the importance of writing. <laughs> um, one of the things that strikes me about this, and I don't know if this is true or not, but my guess would be, is this the first time that we have a television programme in Britain with a television programme inside it? Because, I mean, I mean, this is quite common these days. I'm thinking back to Twin Peaks. I remember seeing it in Twin Peaks. It's There in Ugly Betty, um, a TV show inside a TV show. And here we have the telly screens inside a TV show. Is that, is that a first for British television, do we think? Guys, I'll bow to you two. I mean, when you consider the... the, the mm the problems of actually recording this thing, of actually mm. pointing a, screen, a, a, a mm. camera at a monitor. The technology wasn't... An, I'm struggling to think. And, yeah, and it's hard because we have so mm. little. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it, pre quite a mass mm. experiment. Mm. I mean, there's, there's not... There's mm. Of drama, it mm. went out live. If mm. you wanted to record it, you had to put a camera... Yeah in front of a telly yeah. while it was broadcasting it and yeah. film and put that on film and that's yeah. that's yeah. how you that's why we have yeah. anything from mm. from from slightly simplistic but it's the, the mm. it's it's there that that's why we have anything from from early 50s telly mm. so it's and you know often there isn't a production file mm. on on these things mm. so um Quite possibly, but in honesty, I don't, I don't yeah. really know because I've not seen much sure. telly from them because be a script I can't. Somewhere, yeah. Well, again, it's that thing of you know, if you're going to do that, that's problematic. Yeah, take it Let's out. Do why it. do we do it? And the story is that you know that the sort of spinning light they see under the telly mm. screens was, a, I think, it's a, a yeah. torch. Mm. On, a, a, on a clockwork mechanism with a winding handle. And at one point, I think during the, the, the first of the two performances, they lost the winding handle. <laughs> <laughs> so again, it's that thing of, well, they, they pulled it off, but you have the option of not doing that. And mm. they went for it, and they mm. bold and yeah. inventive. Mm. We've mentioned the Quatermass experiment on a number of occasions. Um, so I think we should talk about this for a moment. I mean, the thing that strikes me um, about the Quatermass experiment That's is... The Sorry, yeah, Karen. Is, is that the wrong picture? No, no, that's right. Well, no. <laughs> the thing, um, I couldn't, sorry, I couldn't, I, I couldn't read it from the bottom. Though, oh, right, there we are. Yeah, <laughs> um, the, the thing that strikes me about the Quatermass experiment, uh, the TV version, I'm not talking about the film version, yeah. is it ends, mm. with, it ends with an appeal to human nature. Oh. Um, yeah, so Quatermass is faced with this monster, sorry, spoilers, people, but it was broadcast in 1953, so I'm kind of assuming <laughs> either you know the story or you don't care. Um, but yeah, so Neil, um, Qua sorry, um, Quatermass is presented with this monster, but he appeals to the humanity, which is still the residual humanity in this monster, and that's how he solves the problem. Yeah. Whereas 1984 seems to me to end with the complete defeat of human nature, the com complete defeat of what I think Orwell calls the spirit of man. Um, you know, can we tell anything at all about Neil's approach to human nature from these two different um the two different scripts two different productions well i i think with neil that uh hope resides with the proles yeah yeah mm. yeah it's it is as simple as that the, the 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 clips that we watched before the one where he's walking through uh, london goes into the bar that's obviously mm. we have that scene in um in the novel um and and yet i when you reread 1984 you, mm. 
Orwell is repulsed by the... You know, it's, I love mankind, it's people I can't stand, yeah? yeah. It's this, he's repulsed by people, he's repulsed mm. by flesh, he's repulsed mm. by women, he's repulsed by hypocrisy, he's, yeah. he's re repulsed by human beings. Mm. But I think particularly in Neil, this is never patronising in Neil, and th this happens again and again in, in stories by Neil, mm. there'll be a moment with some, with some working-class people and you see his, Neil's mm. delight in idiosyncrasy, mm in individuals, mm. in people. Mm. He's just delighted by people speaking mm. and the, the, not the comicness of them, but mm. the aliveness of mm. them, mm. yeah? And I think that's the little crack in Neil where the light mm. gets in that isn't there in Orwell, because right. Orwell doesn't like people. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, again, that may come from Orwell's being far more of the establishment. And yeah, well. he's, and he's dying while he was Yeah, very true, very, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he's, you know. um, And that image is from the film, isn't it? Um, yes. yes. Not, oh, not, curses. Not, not the series. Google Sorry. image search. Let me down. <laughs> well, there we are. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, uh, anyway, but the film has, I think, possibly the biggest difference in, and is a huge shame as to why we, what we miss from, uh, from the TV mm. series, because in the film, um, they just electrocute yeah. The, yeah. the Karoon creature. Mm. There's no... And more than just appeal to its humanity as as um, mm. Quatermass does mm. in uh, the TV series, the fact that the creature is an amalgamation, not, mm. it isn't just Karun, it's mm. all three mm. astronauts have been mm. subsumed into one. Mm. And, though you ha and thus you have all of humanity like, represented mm. by, by these, the, these people. It isn't just Karun's mm. humanity, it's, mm. it's, several, it's, it's, it, it's several people's. Neil would always, you know, mm. would always, give, would, all, all, mm. all, 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 always give that hope. And that's why I think when you watch each of the Quatermass serials, the, 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 the 1950s ones, you've got essentially, you know, variations on a theme of an alien. It's always an alien invasion. Yeah. But in Quatermass Experiment, it's an alien has come, has come mm. to Earth due to... And, you know, this is before Gagarin's mm. flight, so this is, you know, mm. it really is the, un, the undiscovered country. Mm. Um, with Quatermass 2, the aliens are already here. They've taken over institutions because it makes a lot more sense if British institutions are run by unfeeling aliens. That, that, explain, <laughs> that, explain, that explains a lot. And ultimately, in Quatermass in the Pit, uh, the aliens got here five million years ago and they've just, <laughs> and they've just, changed, and they've just changed humanity. Yeah. So all the bad yeah. things about humanity, yeah. they're, they're a potential uh, yeah. a, 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 a result of alien experimentation in our, mm. in, in, our very, in our very primitive days. And if the idea of racism has to be explained yeah. to being alien mm. to, to humanity, mm. that's, that, that's an example of where Neil sees, yeah. sees, yeah. the, sees the good in, good, good in humans. Mm. Yeah, I think so. I mean, in comparing the Quatermass experiment to 1984, obviously 1984 is an adaptation, and I think what yeah. you see there is Neil as a writer who is faithful to the source mm. and faithful to the mm. spirit of it, whether that reflects his his uh, intentions or not. But certainly, comparing the TV version, the Quatermass experiment, to the film, and the you know slightly kind of uh, thoughtful idea of a meditative idea of appealing to the traces of humanity in this sort of mutant creature or sticking a cable in it and electrocuting it, that's, <laughs> that, that's quite insightful in terms of what you lose if Nigel Neal's not involved. He didn't write yeah. the film. No, he didn't write the film, yeah. the, the first yeah. one as well. And Quatermass, there's a lot of, I think, of Neal in Quatermass. Quatermass is a, is a person who is operating beyond his capabilities, mm. but because it's literally um, unknown, yeah. and he's, there's no one else. There's no one else to pass, to pass, to pass the buck to. Quatermass is a person apart, and Neil um, is, a, is, is, a, is a person apart. And I think it's quite easy to mm. compare um, Quatermass's situation of like, he's losing control of the situation and no one else can help him, mm. to the isolation of Smith, mm. Um, yeah. mm. and, and how he deals with people as well. And I think that's, mm. that's where Neil comes in mm. to those characters. Mm. Leaving the fictional universe for a moment and going to the quote unquote real world, um, I've got some I've got some more archival stuff here because I love a, I love an archive. Um, so these are messages of complaint. Um, <laughs> I, I chose a handwritten letter, a typed letter, and a telegram to indicate the breadth of what's in the BBC written archives. Um, they they are good fun to read. They're well worth a read. Um, yeah. So I was surprised that there weren't that many. Oh, it's not a free eye test, by the way. I say they're fun <laughs> to read. That's not a challenge to you. Um, I was surprised how few there were. There, there were a handful. There was there were the, there, there was not a deluge, I would have said, from what, there, from what I could see there. Um, we also have um, newspaper reports. Um, that's Roy Oxley, I think, and his family. Yeah. And Roy Oxley was, is the person who um, played Big he Brother. Big brother yes. So you can see his um, face around the room. 
Um, and you can see the great TV row there. there. There was a campaign in the press to ban the second um, production of 1984 um, due to concerns over its horror value. Um, and then we also have this rather... Um, ex this is one where the kind of the headline gives and the byline takes away because, you know, his wife dies as she watches this horror play and then as you read down, it's clear she didn't die as a result of watching 1984. But there we are. But this is the kind of stuff you get in the papers. So, um, oh, and I think... We, oh, a couple of front pages. There we are, Daily Mirror and um, it's perennial rival the daily sketch again you know all, all of uh, so yeah so it's an ind i chose these two because um it shows that this tv show made the front page um so yeah so to what extent was there a public outcry how much is this overblown by newspapers um what was the yeah what what was the public's response has anyone got any thoughts on that I'm just loving the subheadings on the day. He's like, blood on his face. Rats <laughs> from sewers. Rats from sewers, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> really. um, there was um, uh, a response against it, but it's been massively overblown. Right. It was split. Hmm. Um, it probably helps Neil, and Neil is a storyteller, mm -hmm. um, fundamentally, to exaggerate the level right. of mm -hmm. controversy that 1984 created um there was no serious uh plan to to pull the second mm -hmm. i might say the repeat but the repeat is literally them doing it again yeah. so it's <laughs> the, the second the second the second performance mm -hmm. um if they were planning then it was that was uh changed within i think within 24 hours there was no right. so there was no real mm -hmm. uh no real long running work that it, that it was it's one thing that people um, are more inclined to complain than they mm. are to uh, mm. than, they are, than they are to praise. But in terms, I think they said of um, actual um, uh, research and, 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 and rather immediate research undertaken for since mm. broadcast, it was quite split. Some people, I think, were were upset by it. But it's it's. Less about, I think, individual rats from sewers, which, by mm. the way, the rats are one of the least successful things in, 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 the, in the production. <laughs> but the idea that, you know, it's a television. It's yeah. brand new. You haven't had this very long. Most people would have had it less than a year. A lot of mm. people got tellies the year before for, mm. the, for, the, for the Queen's coronation. Mm. Um, there's only one channel, so you either watch this or you turn it off, and you've yeah. spent a lot of money on this, or you've, you know, you've clubbed together, or, yeah. you've rent, or you've rented this. Mm. The idea of, you know, I want to get my money's worth, yeah. and the idea of something, you know, like a horror film, mm. uh, because it's dealing, with, it's dealing mm. not with themes of you betraying those mm. you love and wanting to betray those you love mm. because they break you to that extent. That's an uncomfortable, mm. a very uncomfortable mm. truth. Suddenly you've gone from the, the contract you enter when you go to a cinema yeah. and, watch, yeah. and watch something. Yeah. This is in your home. Yeah. And I'd rather think sometimes like when, you know, uh, when people talk about when toilets were first introduced into the right. home, the idea of, why would I want that in my home? Yeah. The idea now I have, I have a different relationship with something that's able to broadcast messages. Mm -hmm. into, and, you know, there's, you know, we talk about the TV, the, the, TV, um, the, the, the telescreens yeah. being paramount. Mm. Suddenly you've got, you know, I've got a big screen that's broadcasting mm. stuff at me in my home. Mm. I bet they can listen to me as well. Now we've all got mm. Alexa and like the people are literally recording. We've all got smartphones. Yeah. Yeah. We've got, yeah. This is the beginning of people suddenly realising that being, having messages given to you yeah. in, in the comfort of your own home, in your, in your sacred space, mm. and you maybe not liking those, mm. is something that would be... Um, yeah. Something that will, be, that will be controversial. I think a lot of the reasons are less about an individual piece of sadism or horror, but an unpleasant, uncomfortable message mm. being given to you, mm. not necessarily consensually, mm. in your home. Is a, mm. is a, is a, but the bottom line is... It, the, the controversy is, is, is exaggerated. Right. This is right. Sorry, did you have any... No, I, was, well, I mean, it is in the clip at the start when we see Michael Barry talking that he did, a lot was said about it, a lot was written mm, about it. See, mm. see it right there. But I think that's, that's the thing, is people were split, and it's the first flickerings mm. of what ends up being Mary Whitehouse, and that, that yeah. kind of thing of yeah. television yeah. as a window in the, on the world, but what's, what's it throwing back mm. at us? Is it, you know, an open sewer in, in the corner? Yeah. You can group? fast forward to the early 90s and see almost identical yep. things said about Ghost Watch. Yeah. yeah. Right. Up, to someone, up to someone dying, dying during yeah. watching, yeah, which mm. they didn't. Well, that's that, that story, that, that story about Beryl Murphy who died watching it. The story is that when the doctor arrived at the house, he said, what's she watching the horror play? So it's yeah. almost like looking for yes. that as a fact. Yeah. 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 Mm. It, it, looking at... Um, because I don't think I'd seen... The, the version I'd seen before I saw it at the BFI on Monday or whatever it was, um, was the version that was broadcast, I assume, in 1994. And I think, I could be wrong about this, they excised the intermission 
when they showed it in 1994. One of the things that struck me when I saw the, the full thing on Monday was that you are sitting for five minutes with Big Brother staring at you. It's that poster. Yeah. It's on your screen and there's oh, yeah, there nothing is, else. If you haven't seen minutes. this, there's yeah. a three minute intermission while they do scene changes. Mm. So a card comes up with intermission with Big Brother staring at you and some music playing. Yeah. And that's, that's part of the viewing experience yeah. because they're literally moving scenery yeah. and changing costumes. Yeah. It's a 90 minute. And there production. you are sitting at home. The last thing you saw was young Princess Elizabeth <laughs> become. And there's <laughs> yeah. Big Brother yeah. sitting there for three minutes in the corner of the room. It's incredible. That, that's so brilliant. Uh, isn't that brilliant? Yeah. <laughs> The other yeah. thing which struck me as being very disconcerting about this production was, um, I, I don't know if this is true, but the, what Neil briefs in the script is that the view of the House of Commons that you see in the, first, in the first scene in Oceania is based on the view of the TV test card. So the idea is that you move from the test card, you know, <laughs> pristine yeah. Um, yeah. Palace of Westminster to the bombed out Palace of Westminster and then to the Ministry of Love. Mm -hmm. So in, in that sense as well, he's kind of playing with what's, you know, he's playing with the, the landscape of television and, be, and presenting you with something which is familiar, but also very disconcerting. Mm. So it's, you know, I, I, I take it, yeah, he's, he's, he's not, he does want to frighten us, you know, he does want to put loads of blood on the screen or whatever, he does want cheap thrills, but he is prepared to, to, to present us with things which are very uncomfortable in our own home. Yes, and Neil isn't really a, a, a blood type, Neil's no. the horror of, of, <laughs> of what you, of what you yeah. only see in your head and not, 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 not shown. And it's worth making the point that this was part of a, a strand called Sunday Night Theatre. Mm -hmm. This was a thing that, you know, um, actors were generally free on a Sunday, so this was a good night to put plays on. <laughs> um, so to show this on a Sunday, mm. Um, mm. a couple of weeks before Christmas, I think right. this is part of the reason that people who got upset got obsessed. Again, it's like, mm. what's this in the corner of my room? Yeah. What's it doing to me? You know, during Advent, on a Sunday. Yeah. Um, yeah. And worse than that, I think I kind of liked it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We, oh gosh, here we are. Yes, yeah, so we talked about Quatermass 2 a bit, and I've chosen a clip from Quatermass 2. Up until now, the clips have been provided by the BFI, so they've been, um, they've been pristine and, and very well <laughs> transferred to, to the medium, of the digital medium. Um, the clip we're about to see, I did, so it's the, the quality is not quite as good. I, I apologise for that. Um, anyway, Quatermass 2, I chose this clip because we have Nigel Neal, the voice of the telly screen, but this time it's Nigel Neal, the voice of the um, alien intelligence. But it's the same voice, and it's the same... <laughs> Same production. Um, anyway, could we have uh, could we have the next clip, clip number four, please? If I remember rightly, shortly after that, they, um, the alien intelligence pipes in some calming music, <laughs> which, which I think is a, a beautifully, it's, it's kind of beautifully, um, beautifully dystopian and beautifully manipulative. And it reminds me, I mean, it reminds me of two things. This has the kind of sadism of Orwell, because they, the alien intelligence, if I remember rightly, um, puts in the pipe the remains of a human body. Yeah. It sends it back to, sends it back to the workers who are in revolt there. So there's something very sadistic there. But the calming music reminds me of the, um, the revolt of the epic Epsilons in um, Brave New Worlds and the way the, um, the world state tries to cope with the Epsilons revolting by playing them calming music and speaking to them over the Tanai and those kind of things. Quatermass 2, I think Neil described it as the most political thing he ever wrote. Um, I mean, can we see 1984 influencing Quatermass 2, do we think? I think so, yeah. And again, I think if you look back before what he did before 1984, it does, there does seem to be a sort of a, a change and it does seem to get under his skin. And in some ways, uh, Quatermass 2 is more like 1984 yeah. than it is like the Quatermass experiment. It's about mm -hmm. paranoia and about the state and what's going mm -hmm. on there and, and, and sort of uh, 
surveillance and, and so on. I and it's definitely... brutal. Uh, you have a you know you have you have a sequence of a young family having oh, a, yes. having, yeah. having having a picnic, mm. and it ends with them mm. being being machine gunned to death by oh. security guards. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's and this is not mentally mentally part of the British state. Mm. This is taking place in a roughly contemporaneous mm. you know um, world, um, and it's like yeah, the state the state you don't see. Mm. Uh, what it what what what, it, what it's doing? It's 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 mm. it's a conspiracy thriller, mm. and a conspiracy thriller where it's it's true. It's mm. the you know, but aliens have taken over. Mm. In which case, with the next clip we're going to show, um, we're not going to show it just. I, I've never seen the year of the Sex Olympics. I'm still stuck stuck in the 1950s, as far as you know. In, in so many ways in my life, I'm don't, stuck in the don't 1950s. Google it. Yeah, exactly. It's downhill I saw it all the for way. the first time last week, actually. I watched it for this. So. so this is 1968, and this is this is Neil's dystopia, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Um, so yes. So. Um, you know, I said earlier, if you haven't seen it before, you know, you, either you don't want to see, either you should have seen it or you don't care. I'm, you know, I've fallen foul of my own adage there. I do want to see this. I'm looking forward to seeing this. Um, but anyway, can we have a clip and then, then I'll be really interested to hear what you used to have to say about the year of the Sex Olympics. So, yeah, so tell me about 1984 and, and the Sex Olympics. So, well, yeah, so, I mean, this is... This well, is... it's porno rights, isn't it? We're, yeah. we're seeing the workings of porno rights. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah totally. We're taking us also um, the prescience of 1984 and Neil's uh, showing us basically 
Love Island or mm -hmm. Between yeah. Which Becomes or, you know, um, mm. Married at First Sight or mm. something as well. Things that become... I'm a celebrity, get me Yeah, in. things that are th things that are real human reaction for, 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 for entertainment. Mm. But in the, in the wider context of the programme, yeah, it's... Um, TV essentially controls your, your, your entire life. And it isn't just sex. They have... Uh, there's... Um, <laughs> leading to the best... Uh, credit I've ever seen, <laughs> Custard Pie Fight Arranged By, <laughs> Trevor Peacock, um, is just comedian, highly, and in reality, highly, high, you know, highly skilled actors and comedians uh, chucking food at each other. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, a total, it's a, a, to a total degradation of comedy and entertainment into an <laughs> unbelievably base form, not only a sex, um, uh, and, and now, now uh, an, ent an entertainment and, a, and, a, and a potentially an Olympic sport, but comedy is just... The pr pratfall, even it's not even mm. it becomes almost almost chaotic, mm. uh, and the idea of the further we go, the more debased mm. our arts become, mm. and the more the more debased humanity becomes. You don't need to be a mm. genius to work out beyond a society that has its arts debased is mm. is, uh, is is no longer no longer a society. Mm. And there's messages today you know, mm. um, still in that and. Uh, in the language, as we've already as we've, as we've already discussed, and, and and the way they speak, and that Neil gives mm. them, you know, a unique dialect mm. uh, that you un that you understand. It's such a future. clockwork orange in it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then the young man who we see, uh, protester, yeah, yeah, falling to his death is a, is an artist. Yeah. Who is painting quite shocking uh, images? Yeah, sort of like Francis Bacon sort of style. Yeah, yeah, sort of thing. but can't get them seen. No, and and so he sort of stages a happening to uh, uh, yeah. to get them onto the screen, and um, falls foul of uh, uh, the production crew. <laughs> I mean, he he slips yeah. to his death. I don't think he's not he's not trying he's not, to. You no, know, yeah. he slips to his death while he's trying to get his picture seen, mm. and no one knows how to react. And they cut mm. to and they they cut to you know the proles mm. as if she's yeah. watching, laughing. Mm. They love it. Mm. And the, mm. the, the TV execs can't process what mm. they're, they're wanting, but they immediately see, well, deaths. Yeah, that's a winner. Yeah, I like yeah. that. And you can see that as a TV execs meeting with what can we do? Yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll start killing people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. and we're back to mm. you know they're showing it's the year of the sex Olympics. We, we, you see the sort of imperial mm. uh, Rome. They're going mm. through the togas, and there's like you know, there's like columns in the, in, yeah. in, in the centre. Mm. Again, you don't have to make a great leap to that mm. between. Mm. Throw, you know, what's the orgy to the Colosseum? Yeah, yeah. We'll get and a couple of and, lines in and, and see what happens. And if and if the Romans could have televised the Colosseum, then they would have. They yeah. would have done. Yeah. And that's reality <laughs> telly. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I think this is Neil sort of looking at the world around him. So it's 1968. He's in yeah. his late 40s at this time, <laughs> uh, and he's looking at things like. I say that as somebody who's 50, but yeah, anyway, <laughs> um, but you know, he's looking at you know the the permissiveness, and he's looking mm. at the hair, yeah. particularly mm. he sort of mentions, and where does this lead us? Where do we mm. go from this? Yeah, mm. sort of applying the, the word which is the classic dystopian thing to do, isn't mm. it? You spot the contemporary trends and you ext extrapolate. Yeah, sorry. There's a I, I I won't spoil it for those of you because <laughs> you haven't seen a drama. There, from there is a hard times. swerve in tone, I would yeah. say. Um, oh, it's, it's not even. A, I mean, it feels like a hard swerve, as you, uh, but, you, but you've kind of been led that way, I think. And the, I, I, I hadn't been spoiled, as I say, only watched it last, last week. I managed to stay away from plot summaries, and the, the play goes in a in an extremely interesting direction that is tonally very, very different from uh, the, that that opening fifteen minutes. Um, who is the young actress with the the the, the, the one who's doing the sort of Davina McCall? Because she, I think she's superbly good. I, it's. Uh, I can't remember her name. Can you? Yeah. No, I'm trying to remember the name. Of Pulling off that and and giving that performance, uh, it's just pitch perfect. She's absolutely great. Mm. Um, but I, I find this I, I, this might be my favourite Neil. I think actually, it's a shame. I mean, in practical terms, it's a shame. It was one of the first um, dramas made in colour by the BBC. So actually, mm. a lot of people in sort of gold face. Mark, it look, mm. would have looked amazing. Yeah, it would have. But kind of looks grainy. And also bear in mind that next to no one would have seen mm. it in colour in '68. However, yeah. it was made yeah. to be seen in colour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's a, yeah. That would it would have been nice to see it now. Uh, again, we're just looking at a black and white film copy. Mm. Mm. That was, that was made. No, absolutely. Um, 
Finally, we're kind of we're almost out of time, um, but I want to talk about the kind of influence of Neil's 1984 on kind of subsequent television and, and film. Um, there is some, I mean, obviously, I, I, I think there are definite continuities between Neil's script and what um, um, what Michael Radford did in 1984. I mean, there, there, are, there are particular things that Neil does, um, particularly the delivery of um, Emmanuel Goldstein's book, for example, yeah. the way that's done. That, the, um, um, I think there are, gosh, my mind's gone back. But yeah, there are, there are a number of things where Neil does it in a certain way and, and this follows. Um, seeing the Sex Olympics and, um, and thinking about televisions or television programmes within films, Fahrenheit 451 comes to mind. Um, Francois Truffaut's Fahrenheit 451 from the 60s. Um, Brazil um, strikes me as um, Brazil always wonderful, always worth a watch. Um, yeah, there, there seem to be um, aesthetics from um, the BBC's 1984 which are kind of picked up there. Um, and I'm always thinking about Blade Runner. Whatever I'm talking about, I'm always thinking about Blade Runner. So yeah, maybe there's some Blade Runner in there too. Have you got any thoughts on, on how, um, or the extent to which um, Neil's take on dystopia has, uh, has affected um, subsequent these, cinema? These tap back to Metropolis as well, of yeah. course. Mm. Yeah. Um, mm. But and, and I will talk about Blake 7 now. <laughs> <laughs> I hoped you yeah, would. Yeah, the, the opening episode of Blake 7, which is, is, is tonally very, very different from uh, mm -hmm. the rest of the show, is, is uh, it's practically, it's almost shot for shot, isn't it? Yep. Um, uh, Neil's 1984. It's uh, very, very, very much uh, our protagonist, Blake, who is a, has, has been brainwashed, but is a, a revolutionary. He's, he's mm. constantly being shot through lenses mm. through there's yeah. a shot of him through a circle that's almost mm. identical yeah. to that mm. little shot we saw of uh, Winston Smith earlier um, so that that episode in particular I think that, that wouldn't exist and of course uh, Neil would hate this but Doctor Who wouldn't hate hey, it without him <laughs> Obviously, Neil had a, a massive impact on uh, on Doctor Who. I think uh, Doctor Who basically remakes all three Quatermasters. Yeah, well, if you, I mean, I remember the first time <laughs> I saw uh, Quatermaster Two. And the first, mm -hmm. if, if you're familiar, you know, I'm familiar with Doctor Who, and you've not seen Quatermass Two, then um, if you watch John Pertwee's first story, Spearhead from Space and then watch the first episode of, of Quatermass 2, and they both open with a meteor shower, <laughs> with a tracking station looking at a meteor shower, with a meteor hitting the earth, with a, with a local yokel finding it. I've so, seen this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it's, 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 mm. yeah, and I think um, he was asked to write for, for, for Doctor Who more, more, than, more than one occasion, and he not particularly politely declined on, mm. on, 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 on more than one occasion. Uh, he, actually, interesting, Neil didn't like Doctor Who initially because he said it was too scary for children. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he told Verity Lambert that it was, yeah, he was, um, you shouldn't be scaring kids with this as mm. well, which is curious. Uh, yeah. Not necessarily a reason. Later on, he would have, I see, more justifiable cause to say, you've literally just <laughs> nicked my stories. <laughs> and it's weird. Um, but... But that's but Doctor Who wasn't it was not, wasn't only Nigel Neal that 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 that, that, that Doctor Who stole from as regards sort of visions vi, vi, mm. visions of the future. Yes, I think 1984 comes into play. But as Una says, that's um, Metropolis. I think things to uh, things mm. to come mm. uh, the, the films as well. Mm. Are much the sort of the, the the sweeping vistas of old of 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 of, of, of old cinema mm. and those those those, mm. those 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 model shots. Whenever I think of the opening sequences of see of Blade Runner, mm. you know, the sort of beautiful um, mm. but yet quite depressing city city vistas. Mm. I think of uh, yeah, I think of those those silent films mm. yeah. where almost scale is irrelevant. Um, mm. Nothing, nothing's mm. nothing's beyond 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 imagination. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's always interesting to speculate. You know, obviously, 1984 gets dropped as an influence. And, oh, what was it? But which version of 1984? Mm, yeah. Were you reading the book? Were you reading one of the different? And you know, the the, the TV version, as we've said, wasn't actually freely available for a long time. Yeah. So mm. it would have been the case that maybe people saw it and it stayed with them. And mm. Ridley Scott worked for the BBC. Was a BBC, yeah, was a BBC so, staff designer? You know, yeah. That's not too much of a stretch. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's kind of. Uh, Impossible to tell, but interesting to speculate about how actually it sort of dropped in as an influence a lot of down the years, I think. Mm. In terms of the popular imagination, you, want, you wonder how much the sort of visual memories of that yeah. are mixed oh. up with readings th of the book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, I, I, but I also think that the, the, both the, 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 the 54 production and mm. the reaction to it, even if that's a slightly false memory yeah. mm. of the reaction to it, play as much mm. to make 1984 mm. as part of British mm. culture... Mm. As part of the British canon, um, we would go on to have two programmes that um, Nigel Neal may have opinions about, named directly after things mm. in, uh, in... Oh, yes, in, yeah. Mm. Uh, in, in 1984, in Big Brother in Room 101. Mm. Um, and I think Neil and Cartier play their part 
in making 1984 part of sort of the, both British literary canon mm. and as part of British popular culture. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Orwellian things. Yeah. Near, near, where I, near where I live, uh, there are two bits of graffiti um, saying COVID 1984. Right. Um, <laughs> which um, Orwell might have been surprised about, but I don't mm. think Neil would have been. Right, yeah, yeah. I could be wrong, but as I seem to remember when you read the book, Big Brother is watching you now to hear a poster. It's kind of mentioned in passing, but obviously mm. when you see it yep. on the yeah. wall everywhere, mm. then it, it kind of it's buries ridiculous. itself in your imagination. Yeah. That's yeah. what, isn't it? Mm. And I understand that um, it, was, it was Neil's production which catapulted 1984 to becoming a bestseller. Yeah. yeah. Even though, you know, it was, it was four or five years old by that yeah, point. Was, yeah. So, yes. And supposedly well, the film version, which was kind of in, in the pipeline anyway, got the go-ahead yeah. because that was so successful. Mm. Mm. Well, we've, we've come up to date, or at least as far as I'm concerned, 1982 is up to date. As I say, I live <laughs> a lot of my life in the 50s. Um, so for Missing me, out 1968, though. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so for me, this is, this is still the future that I'm thinking about. And um, we've got a couple of minutes left. Do we have any questions about um, all well about Neil, about 1984? I'm prepared to take questions on Blade Runner. I dare say that somebody on the panel will talk about either Doctor Who or Blake Seven. Um, <laughs> perhaps a couple of us, who knows? If you have, please raise your hand and a microphone will be um, carried towards you. Oh, there's somebody over there. Looking the wrong way. No, I, I, I uh, first came across Quatermass from my uh, grandfather in the, the uh, 70s. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and timing-wise, it, it worked out because he mentioned it and he was quite a cynical character, but it really struck a chord with him, especially Quatermass in the pit. And... Then they published the scripts. Mm. And, I, and that's how I first came across Quatermass. And then there was a 1980 TV series? 79. 79, which I, I, I saw some of. It was quite late. I was a bit too young. But yeah, it, it really struck a chord. And, and, the, bo and the books, uh, reading them as a script, all three, you know, start, yeah. you know Experiment 2 and then The Pit, I mean, it was, it was quite, mm. quite... I don't know, it's hard to describe. It was, it, was, it, was, it was wonderful. I mean, it was really quite tense just reading mm -hmm. these scripts, mm -hmm. just as a script. And you can just imagine, and now you can see what it's like on TV. So I've seen all of them. Yeah. Uh, I saw the, the recent remake about five or six years ago, mm -hmm. eight years ago. They did one on BBC yeah. Four for the experiment, mm -hmm. didn't they? And it's just that, it's a kind of haunting Mm. The way you put them together. I, know, I just wanted to say that those scripts coming out was so timely for me to get mm. into Quatermass as, as a 12-year-old. It's, it's interesting because I think they were very influential, those, those script books, and quite, yeah. quite a bold move in terms of publishing at the time. What, you're going to do some television scripts out? It's a book. <laughs> um, but, you know, before VHS, before DVD, mm. how, yeah. if something's shown live and gone... Mm. What's the trace of it? They, How do you yeah. encounter them? They re those originally came out. It was Penguin. So it wasn't. It was a mainstream publisher within 1960. Then they were re-released for when the Houston films Quatermass um, came out, along with the novelisation of Quatermass. And yeah, it was. It would seem strange now. Why would you release a, a, a script book? But as Andy said, there was the, those. Mm. The ephemeral nature of TV meant mm. those those stories were gone. Mm. And I think they travelled quite widely as well. They sort of were read around the world, whereas obviously the originals weren't. Seen yeah, I've spoken to people that read them in America. Mm. Was, yeah. mm. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Over there. It's one of those, it's a reflection as well as a question. Um, it just strikes me, having listened to this fascinating conversation, particularly how so much of the, the work in um, Neil's version uh, prefigures the modern world of social media and algorithms. Mm. And of course, downstairs from where we were in 1949, EDSAC was created, and a lot of the, the, the surveillance society started just where we are. Mm. Uh, and I wonder, sort of, if you'd, like, if you'd like to reflect on, on these, these connections, because... Uh, it seems to be a very interesting one, and how much an understanding of the surveillance society has shaped the development of modern technology, or indeed sadly failed to, that we failed to hear those warnings that were implicit in popular culture in the work of Neil and others. My only thought on that is that it seems to me that today we are simultaneously horrified by the notion that we are being surveilled, 
and and at the same time, we are incredibly comfortable with it in the sense that we, we carry surveillance um, devices, as John was saying earlier, we carry surveillance devices around with us all the time. So, yeah, so we seem to have a very kind of schizophrenic attitude to surveillance right now. Um, on the subject of surveillance in film and surveillance, um, the influence of Neil, I was really struck recently seeing The Batman, the new Robert Pattinson Batman movie, which I saw last week, which I absolutely adored and said it's great. Um, yeah, I was really interested in the, in the way in which surveillance was part of that and in the way in which the, the um, just like Nigel Neal's telescreens are all round, all of the surveillance gear that Batman has in his Batcave, they're all round screens and they're all in sepia. Um, there seem to, I don't know if that's, um, if I'm just, if I just see Nigel Neal everywhere these days um, or whether that's really, uh, you know, some influence there. But, you know, I, yeah, that's my thoughts on surveillance. Anyone else? I think there must be an alternate universe where we're having this event and we're watching this saying, isn't it amazing what people used to worry about? <laughs> and obviously the problem is you actually think, no, mm. same. Mm. Mm. That's, I think, because um, both Neil and... Uh, well, particularly, sorry, particularly Neil, uh, understands, human, understands human nature. Um, he's optimistic about it, but he isn't, he isn't sentimental mm. uh, about mm. it. We know where these... Uh, we know where these things could go. The other thing about um, the book, which is, which is quite surprising, it's very sexual. Mm. Um, the, the, mm. you know, and um, they bring that out to a certain extent. Like Julia says, it's like when you make love. I mm. mean, they, they refer to the climax of hate week as a shuddering orgasm. Yeah. That's, yeah. You know, it's, it's mm. uncomfortable viewing yeah. or uncomfortable <laughs> reading for people in, for people in, uh, in, the, in the late... In, in the late for, in the late forties and, and uh, early fifties, and other the novel goes further with you know the dehumanisation of refugees, which is yep. still so tragically relevant. Mm. So, tra so tra tragically relevant. So, but alongside that, yeah, the uh, the idea of surveillance would just mm. be a thing that if you think about, you're individually concerned about. Mm. But if it inconvenient, but if 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 you if it's sold in a way of being convenient, mm. like with with you know with your smartphones or with, mm. or with, or with, or with Alexa. And there's, sort of, there's loads of telly that comes in in the, in the, in the, in the 70s or in, 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 indeed in film where you have these sort of magic computers that just say, mm. close the curtains and stuff of that yeah. as well. It's, it's, taken as a, it's, take, it's, it's taken as a laugh. And I wouldn't want that. Mm. But it comes in gradually that I can have something in my room that can answer random questions. I'm not entirely sure why I'd, why I'd want that. <laughs> Um, but people, people seem, people seem, seem to like, to like it. What's the weather going to be like, Alexa? It's going to rain late. Well, just check on. <laughs> there's any weather? It's, Look out the window. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's no fun in that, is there? Look yes. out the window. No, definitely not. Well, I think we're we're kind of out of time. Like Winston <coughs> Smith, like the Society of Oceania, we are tyrannised by the clock here. <laughs> so we better we better call it a day. Thank you, and all see. Um, and can I have a round of applause for my panel, um, Andy, John, and Una? Thank you very much to them. Thank you very. Thank you very much to the BFI and the BBC for making these clips available to us. Thank you for Homerton College for supporting my research. And thank you enormously for the festival team um, for preparing the venue and helping me put up the imposters of Big Brother. So, yeah. Well, um, yeah, thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>